Good evening all, and welcome. Being in the armed forces is no easy feat. And before we begin, I'd just like to say thank you to each and every one of our service men and women for their continued bravery. They have seen some really messed up things, which you're about to find out. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was in the British Army, and stayed over a weekend on a course as it was too far to travel home. The camp was dead, 12 people in total. I was the only person in the female block, which was joined to an old building that was used as a morgue. The upstairs was blocked off, empty, and had a huge heavy padlock and chain. The first night I was awoken by what sounded like footsteps and beds being dragged above me. I checked the parts of the building that I could get into, and there were no signs of anyone. The following morning, I was startled to see a middle aged woman in the corridor. And I said hi, and assumed she must be a cleaner. I nipped to the loo where there were no doors to the bathrooms, and the toilet cubicle was pretty much open so I could hear everything there. There was only silence and me peeing. I washed my hands and then ran across the corridor to grab my wash kit and realized the woman had gone. I looked around and there was no sign of her. Yet the two large heavy fire doors to the exit building had not made a sound. I found out on Monday that only one person had access to the upstairs and no one had been up in years. Civvy staff didn't enter the camp on weekends. Plus they needed keys for buildings. And when I described the woman, none of the permanent staff knew of her as it was a small camp. Apparently everyone who stayed in the building had reported strange things. November 15th, 2015. I was already a few months into my deployment to Gotemba, Japan. We were supposed to be building a small parking lot for the local population, along with other various projects to strengthen our relationship with Japan in general. We had finished up a long day of working, and were going to take a truck back to the barracks. A group of my co workers were planning to go out that night and asked if I wanted to tang along. It was ramen night after all. So I couldn't say no. As the time to walk to the gate rolled around, we had a little safety brief about what to do and what not to do. But what caught my attention was the last thing that my LPO put out. Apparently there had been a rumor that there were a couple of local killings that were happening in the surrounding area. And the suspect was described as not having any facial features. That was the only thing that went through my mind when that bit of information was put out. Because who would believe such utter nonsense from your typical LPO? Anyway, with that being said, a group of four individuals, myself included, headed down the hill, exited the gate and began our trek down this big ass hill. Leaving the base and going down the hill is like taking a trip from the past and going to the future. Further and further down you go, it starts to replicate Tokyo, from the occasional house, cemetery, pattern, to a full city of stores and restaurants ready to explore. But anyway, after we went to shops and stuffed ourselves with the best food we have ever had, it was time to go back, and we only had 30 minutes until curfew. There weren't any taxis around, and everyone seemed to be heading back home for the night. Then someone pointed out this old city bus that just by the grace of God happened to be going back up the hill in the same direction we were going. So we all hopped on and sat at the back, trying our best to not disturb the others. That's when it just happened. I looked out the window. And for what seemed like a good minute time stood still. And by the next bus stop on the opposite side of the street is where I saw her. I thought I was going crazy. She had a long white dress and had long black hair that came down to her waist. But when she lifted her head up, there were no facial features at all. I nearly punched my friend at the arm and yelled for him to look out the window when I saw and his face went pale. So we both went back down and tried to rationalize what we saw. 
but nothing, and I mean nothing, could explain it. Eventually, we finally made it back to the gate, and checked in before curfew ended, and finally went to sit down in the common area, and talk about what we saw. But when my other two co-workers entered the room and asked what was going on, which then we pretended like nothing had happened at all, they asked, did you hear that lady say don't look out the window? Something about how she'll see you? Man, I swear there are some crazy people in this world. That was the last thing I wanted to hear because it only validated what we saw wasn't a dream and was real. 70 years ago, my grandpa joined the army when he was 17. After he joined, he was relocated to Arequipa, which is a city in Peru, and he lived there with 2,000 others. There he lived in the army facilities divided into different blocks. One night, his rounds were changed, so he was dismissed very late at night. While walking back to his dorm, he decided to walk inside the building. When he walked along the hallway in his block, he noticed another person was walking in the opposite direction, and he said that he could not recognize this guy. So trying to get a conversation started, he said, good evening, but received no reply. Right there at that moment, he felt scared. He had chills running down his back. Then he stopped and walked back to reach out to the man. And this turned back and he started to walk. So he crossed him once again and repeated, good evening, expecting an answer. But the guy stood there in front of him and started laughing, showing dark yellow teeth. My grandpa said that he yelled all caliber bad words. And while doing it, he noticed the man thing running away, moving his arms like he was paddling and disappeared into a wall. Then my grandpa fainted and was found by his friends. Weeks later, he was called by his superiors and was told that many years ago, there was an earthquake that destroyed the old facilities and ended some people's lives in there. Yet, they also told him that the person he saw was a cadet like him, who practiced rowing and passed during the earthquake. There's an old hospital building on Pearl Harbor that holds offices. There's a 24 hour watch there. It's said to be pretty haunted. One night I was standing watch and I was moving the cameras around. I ran across what looked like a person standing near the fence. It looked weird and no one goes to that area of the base. So I tell Rover, who's my guy who walks around to go there and see what the person's doing. Just moments before Rover enters the frame, the person seems to walk away and he radioed back saying no one was in the area. My second experience is in the same building. I'm on watch again, it's storming and this building has a tendency to flood. So I get a call from the building manager to go check on the basement for flooding. I'm tired of sitting so I go downstairs with another person on watch. And as we were walking around down, we both hear someone say, Hey, I turn around and ask the person that I'm with, what is it? And he's staring at me white as a ghost. When he realizes it wasn't me who said, Hey, he just takes off. The building certainly has creepy vibes. My dad worked at base security for a US Navy shipyard in Scotland in the late 1980s. They would drive the perimeter of a huge open lot to stop people from climbing the fence. One night, they were driving along a narrow tunnel of fence line when they spotted something huge blocking the road. There was a machine engine in the middle of the road. He described it as the size of a small car, something they would have to use a crane and flatbed truck to move. Just totally unexplainable, especially since that section of the road leads nowhere and was locked by gates on both ends. And my dad, and two other men would have spotted a truck or helicopter operating in the area, or the fact that the guard detachment had to check every hour. I've had a few scary stories told to me. NBK Bangor in Washington. There's a story that a long time ago, this little Native American girl was ended 
by men who owned this land before it was made into a base. The creepy thing is that her burial site is in the base, buried deep within the woods. When I was taking the classes to drive an armoured vehicle, we had to do night drives on and off road, and we got very close to this site. The sergeant who was operating as my second set of eyes looks to the right side of the vehicle and told me to stop. It's pitch black, I can't see without the NVD, and I think the sergeant is just trying to mess with me. The two other vehicles stop behind us, and they get out asking what's up. The sergeant says he knows he saw something in the woods when we were driving. It was out of my line of sight, so I didn't see it, but my sergeant was really spooked. The vehicle behind us started talking about the girl, and a marine that ended his life 10 years or so ago. I'm not a believer in any of this. So I say let's just finish up because it's already 2am, and we've got to go through this course the second time. I'm the passenger, and the sergeant is in the back, while a corpsman drives. I saw some stuff the entire time, and said nothing. I asked around a little bit, and that's when I found out about the burial site. The thing is, what I saw looked like a small person, maybe four foot tall, at random clearings in the woods. Definitely not shadows. Definitely not the MVD malfunctioning. It was real. I've had other people go on this course, and tell me they've experienced similar things as well. In 2005, I hit Okinawa, Japan's shores at the ripe age of 19, I've never had an experience or reason to believe in paranormal stories, but for the next two years all was well, drinking, smoking, and generally having a good time. In 2006 I sustained an eye injury in Fallujah, Iraq, that put me out of commission. Every marine is a rifleman, and as I could no longer shoot, they made me a barracks manager as my unit was deployed yet again. I was pumped for this job, as I didn't want to be just charged before my four years was up. That, and everyone knew it was a skate job, aka super easy. I had the usual problems of broken furniture and such for a while, and one day a marine comes into my office and tells me there's a woman with a white dress with long black hair that covers her face who sits up in the upper corner of the room and watches him as he sleeps. I think to myself this man has watched the ring too many times, and I tell him that I can't change his room, and to move on from it. At this point in time, I'm manager of Barrack 5696, and there came a time where Barracks 5704 diagonal from us was empty, and we needed renovations. I was in charge of moving everyone to 5704, so they could begin renovations. After all had been moved and everything was calm, I began an addiction to watch shows like Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters, back when they were fresh and new. I thought to myself, this is all rubbish, and found myself verbally saying such out loud, and a buddy of mine said, hey man, don't you have the keys for 5696? He was right, I did, and it was totally empty, at night. Peaking my interest, I bought a tape recorder, old school, not a digital recorder, and went to the room that the Marine told me about a nearly a year back, and set the thing on the top of the mirror above the sink, locked the door and left. The only entrance to Barrack 5696 was that one, and I went back to 5704. The next day I let the Japanese painters in to do their job, as I did every day, and went up to room 423 to collect the recorder off the top of the mirror. I returned back to my office, 5704, and listened to the tape. I spent four hours listening to nothing, dead space, then it happened. The wall locker in a room next to or near room 423 began slamming shut, open shut, open shut, and this went on for a few minutes. It seemed the building had come alive. I was disturbed as I was the only individual with a key on them. Any enlisted even above me would either have to ask me for the key or get one made. Once they did, I cannot fathom them with wanting to slam wall lockers closed in the middle of the night, 
not able to slam as many as I was hearing at the same time without 20 people there to help them. Yet I heard nothing but slamming wall lockers. No footsteps, no voices, no nothing. Knowing I placed the recorder and told no one about it, locked the door to the room and the main door to the barracks, creeped me out. No one had access to this barracks, nor knew of my intentions. I was convinced the ghost realm was real. Just like Zack, I wanted to find out what was out there. I wanted more proof of these spirits. Barracks 5696 was still under renovations, which meant it was an empty night, as no Japanese working crews, and I held the only key. I convinced a buddy of mine, who I will refer to as Gary, to come with me. We were going to conduct a live ghost hunting session. As exciting as it sounds, it wasn't. We never heard or saw anything. Being my slash his first time, we felt we were talking to empty rooms of nothingness, and we felt like nothing was there. We would pick random rooms throughout the barracks, opening whichever room we felt at the time, and walk down to the office of 5696. It still had power, and the office was functional, and we joked that there wasn't anything there. The banging wall lockers still haunted my thoughts, and I aimed to know more. I plugged in my digital recorder, an upgrade from the tape one into the PC, and started the exhausting journey of reviewing our files, one for each room. Gary was convinced that we entered rooms three or four times on the recordings when it happened. I said the usual, good evening, my name's Will, and Gary asked for their names. Clear as day, we got a response that said, get out, neither of our voices, and we were within arm's reach of each other. This was the first time of many threats I received attempting to find the truth inside the barracks, a truth that came to infest my home life and made me never want to mess with this again. Of course, as a madman, I persisted. I was living off... The story continued. I was living off base at the time with a girlfriend in a 10 story building. We were on the 10th floor and everything seemed fine when we moved in. At least she never mentioned anything at this point. After a few weeks of doing EVPs nightly at 5696, she started to talk about this shadow person. I asked her where she saw it. Was there anything about it other than shadow? Was it threatening or the usual stuff? She said it always walked in the closet had some color of glowing eyes, orange I believe, and just creeped her out in general, but never tried to harm her. After hearing this, I started to freak out. I was having some issues in 5696, and I never mentioned them to her, but it seems I may have brought some home. During this time frame, I started getting strange things on my EVPs, not the usual get out or hellos, but things that seemed far more intelligent and sinister. For instance, I always introduced myself. Hello, good evening, my name is William. I only wish to communicate and mean you no harm besides my name. These entities should have known nothing else about me. I was getting responses from them, calling me by my childhood nickname, a name I hadn't used in years. And the other guys with me damn sure didn't know it. They once asked who my mother was, who your mother is. Now, this may not have been specifically aimed towards me, if it wasn't followed up by a whisper saying my mother's name, in a different voice from the first. I lost patches of hair from the back of my head that looked like four fingerprints in a pattern, suggesting something had grabbed the back of my head. Doctors said it was stress and gave me steroid shots, but the hair refused to grow back for three months. Three months just so happened to be the same amount of time I grew concerned with the EVPs I was getting, and threw in the towel. I locked up 5696 one final time and never returned there after dark. The hair that grew back in those spots was pitch black, and I have blonde hair, and stayed that way for years. These days it's slightly lighter, probably from the sun exposure, but still not the same color it should be. Finally, I had a dream in the 10 story building right before I quit. And it was some kind of evil red creature laughing and prodding me whilst it tortured me. When I woke up and realized it was just a dream, I was relieved. 
Shortly after this dream of mine, which I never told anyone and my girlfriend had a similar version of, we went through a rough patch and I moved out of the apartment. She left shortly after stating something was bothering our son in the middle of the night, something unseen. Today she is a minister and swears to me I brought something evil home all those years ago, and it has been following her for years. Camp Dragoon in Iraq had weird things happen in different places. The camp was an old Saddam regime secret police complex, so plenty of people disappeared there, just to add to horrific background. The underground tunnel had torture chambers that had been walled off early, but people who went down there reported feelings of being watched. I took pictures in an old prison, and weird balls of light showed up when I got them developed by the locals. I chalked that up to dust in the air. The one that happened over and over though was lights in the buildings where they shouldn't be. I was part of the quick reaction force for the camp and was called out too many times to recall to look for intruders. We had apartment buildings on our camp, unused but off limits and at least once a month guard towers, the tactical operations center or random people would report faint lights moving within. Every time we got spun up and cleared the whole building, but not even the dust had been disturbed. People tired, reflections, soldiers banging and being sneaky. I don't know, but it was weird and unexplained. I also heard a story that one night a vehicle, its white lights on, which is a big no, no, drove off to a new position claiming they kept hearing things moving around them, but never could see anything. They said that over radio, so either they just really hated that position at the time or something weird was going on. Something about staring into the dark for hours has a way of playing tricks with your head though. When I was in Vilsack, Germany, the Rose Barracks, as part of the 1st Infantry Division, I had an interesting run. This was about the year 2001. And not long after a long deployment at Kosovo, I was an E4 about to be promoted to sergeant and had a fellow NCO who named his Humvee Area 51. He told me he'd been stationed there for a while as part of a security team made up of army and air force. And he told me lots of bizarre stories about things he saw from rumors. He then introduced me to a website called the Black Vault. The website is still around but it's far less conspiracy driven these days. The site contained a lot of conspiracy theory stuff, Freedom of Information Act material, lots about the UFO projects like Project Blue Book. With hindsight, it's probably a bad idea to look all this stuff up on a government computer at work. He and I both had a series of encounters with military intelligence and even an actual CIA spook over the next year. They went through my living quarters while I was at work, trailed us, and a year later I relocated to the National Guard in Texas and it all ended. But it was a strange amount of attention to receive about a subject that's nonsense to our government. I've been in the Navy for four years. I'm operational on my first ship. I've been underway a few times. I'm medical on the ship, and I, besides the other people, have my own group of friends I hang out with. A couple of machinist mates, and a few other cooks. They're a little dumb, but they're cool. Well, after being underway for three weeks, we were pulling back into our home port and doing line handling, rigging the ship to the pier. And for those people who think the Navy isn't dangerous, people perish all the time. And this is one of the problems. One of my cook friends was doing the line handling and had a line snap back. These nylon lines snap back at the speed of a bullet and will rip through anything. Except it snapped where the men were standing. And Gary, the cook, was the only one hurt somehow. I didn't see it happen. Gary lost both his legs. The line somehow ripped them off. Me and another dog tried to save him but he succumbed to his wounds. I still beat the living crap out of myself every day for it. 
and a few months later we went underway again. It was about six days into it, and I had watch. It was between midnight to 6am, and I was tired as hell walking back to my birthing, and had my first weird occurrence. Every time I walked, something was ahead of me, like I heard footsteps on the metal floor. That in itself wasn't weird, but I was curious who was there, so I tried walking faster, and the footsteps matched my pace. I did a test and stopped moving, and it went quiet. I walked again and it started again, so I tried to ignore it. The second thing was the next night. I was up late until about midnight, as the ship life means you work 12 hour workdays if you're lucky, and I was going to sleep, but kept waking up because someone was walking past my bed out loud. It didn't wake anyone else up, I suppose, because no one else knew when I'd spoken about it but I tried peeking my head out to see who it was a few times. Once when they walked past, and once when I heard them coming up. Every time I did, it stopped, like no one was there, like I imagined it. I talked to people and they're just like, maybe it's someone from a different birthing, or maybe it was an officer. I have no idea why someone would stay up, or skip their duty risking getting a major ass chewing just to walk a birthing or why an officer would even go near our birthing. The most likely thing I heard was it was someone on watch, maybe, but no one in their boots sounded like this. It wasn't heavy sounding, it just sounded different. That's what kept me up. About two weeks in, there was a guy on watch topside. He started a man overboard alarm, and we all had to muster, but literally everyone was accounted for. When someone falls off the ship, they make everyone get together and see if they have everyone to see who is missing, but everyone was there. They didn't find anyone in the water, and the guy on watch got captain's mast, and I talked to him. He claims he saw someone in uniform sprint and jump off the ship. Before that, he said he was just staring into the dark area, and could barely make him out. Personally, I'm surprised he could see anything, because it gets almost pitch black out, and before he could really call out to him, he ran off and jumped. Very creepy. At Sandhill, we had a demon in our bay. We had some sort of ritual scene take place in our bay one night while we were sleeping. Our fire guard woke up the entire bay at roughly 1am, and screaming, at our PG over the incident. According to the guys on fire guard, the one on the first bunk to the left of the fire guard's desk, both of the dudes top and bottom came off their bunks, fell to their knees and started making hushed whisper noises like they were praying, then every other bunk after them, faced back towards the latrine. When everyone had faced the whispering prayers got a little bit louder, and Fireguard decided to flip on the lights and start screaming. I wasn't there, however, because I was doing my battle buddy, and I'm laundry. So I only saw the aftermath of the Fireguard halfway to tears, and they were pretty solid dudes. But I had my doubts it was a real thing, until fast forward to about a week later, and I see that thing. I truly believe this was a demon. In our platoon alone, we had five guys attempt to take their lives, and one had a very serious chance of succeeding. If we hadn't have come up the stairs in time, the guy tried to do it on the balcony with his belt, but we cut him down. His neck turned out to be broken. So that night, I came back up to grab my battle laundry, and we trade off doing each other's and I'm about to wet myself in the kill zone, which is shaded by a massive locker and weapon racks, and there's this huge dark mass that almost looks like a female figure, darker than cave darkness, and there seems to be appendages or something swirling around it. It was just slowly moving towards the bunks on the other side, and I looked to the fire guard, and they were out cold. Everyone was. I simply closed the door from the stairwell to the bay and got out of there. It's easily one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen, and it still fills me with fear and sends shivers down my spine. 
I would later see this same disturbing creature walking swiftly past the drill sergeant's office and down the stairs later on in basic. A good friend of mine from WI that I met in boot camp for the Navy came out of school with me in California for a few years. We started experimenting with psychedelics while freshmen and in the dorms had a mutual paranormal experience. My old university is built from the skeleton of an old army base that was a really big base for artillery and such down in the Clinton era. Everyone jokes the dorms were haunted because they were repurposed military barracks. We also had dilapidated rundown old admin and hospital buildings around the campus that all intoxicated college students would explore as a sort of rite of passage. So one day we took a good amount of acid and had a grand old time. As we were peeking, we decided to lock ourselves in our windowless bathroom and put our headphones in and just jam to music. It was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, let alone each other across the bathroom. All of a sudden the room expands in size and it's like I'm in a very large square room with benches on all sides. On these benches are shadowy people of various shapes, sizes, genders and ages. The problem is that they're all angry, sad and hurting and not pleased that I can see them. I got really uncomfortable quite fast and almost had to leave. But dead ahead was one shadowy figure that didn't seem to mind my presence. He was actually very calming and soothing despite being made out of blackness. I could still make out the edges and some details of his silhouette. He looked like an average sized man in full dress uniform for the army. He didn't speak to me per se, but he helped me understand the circumstances and resume my endorsement of a pretty intense and vivid trip. I decided not to mention it to anyone as I figured it was just what we took doing its thing. The next morning, we met up with another friend of ours that was babysitting us to discuss the trip. And he commented that after we left the bathroom, we were pretty quiet for the rest of the night and didn't say much. Then we went back to bed. My friend cautiously asked me if I felt weird that morning or if I had any initials stuck in my head. I asked him to clarify because when I woke up, I couldn't stop thinking about the name Roy J. Miller. He seemed startled and said that he had the initials RJM stuck in his head all morning. We looked to our friend who said that neither of us had mentioned anything like that. A bit perplexed, we shared experiences. Apparently, we both experienced a version of the same room, the shadow people and the sharply dressed military man who soothed our frantic minds and emotional states. We looked it up and an East Garrison of Fort Ord the base our school was built on, and my dorm building was supposedly the East Garrison. There was a man there stationed named Roy James Miller, who went overseas to Vietnam in 1968 and passed while serving in the army. I saw a picture and it looked about right from what I could remember. I couldn't believe it. I've told this story a few times, still not entirely sure I believe it myself, but I can't deny that it happened and neither can my friends. Throughout my life, a lot of strange things have happened to me. And I'm hoping that by sharing these stories, some of you might be able to spread some light on what I've seen. When I was about 13 years old, I had a small room and the setup was pretty cramped. My closet wall was about a foot and a half across from the edge of my bed where my head lay. On that wall was a poster sized frame of a guardian angel on a bridge with two kids. My family is Catholic and Hispanic, you see. One night, I happened to wake up in the middle of the night and looked at that wall to see the picture was no longer in its place. I looked down and didn't see it on the floor directly below either. Instead, the pictures were directly under my bed with the image face up and the glass broken on the top of the image. 
From what I assumed, there's no way the picture could have fallen and ended up like that. Anyone have any ideas? As a younger child, I had been quite mischievous and typically got in trouble for messing things up or doing things that my parents specifically told me not to do. There was an incident where I had found myself in trouble. And when my mother was scolding me, she had angrily asked, why would you do this? What made you do this? And for some reason, the 10 year old me just spouted out, the devil made me do it. But I don't really remember why I would have said that. As a teen, I spent a lot of time in my room on my computer. And my room was my comfortable place. My nephew who was around five at the time also liked to play on my computer. There was a time when he came running out of my room scared and yelling about a monster. So I walked into my room to check for said monster and assured him there was nothing there. He returned to the computer and only lasted about five minutes before running out crying and yelling again about the monster. I still am unsure as to what happened there. Since I was raised in a Hispanic Catholic family, my mother hung up many religious images like crosses and statues all over our house. There was a small porcelain statue of a young Jesus that was set in place on a wall in my room. One day I was dusting off all the furniture in my room, including the porcelain statue, which stood about seven inches tall, and it fell to the carpet as I was wiping off the dust. When it fell a grand total of three feet, the statue broke in a fairly straight line across the statue's neck, essentially decapitating it on soft carpet. Nothing else broke off but the head. Brushing it off as no big deal, I used some clear nail polish to reattach the head and put it back on my wall. I didn't think much of it back then, but as I've grown older, it does make me wonder why only the head fell off. Right after high school, I left for the Navy. I figured it would be the best route to take since I wasn't committed to the idea of college right away. On my first command in Washington DC, I made friends with some of the cool kids and was invited to a going away party for my roommate's boyfriend. I'm not the type to party or socialize in general, so I declined. But of course, I found myself surrounded by three large men, one of them being my roommate's boyfriend, demanding that I go to the party and that I didn't have a choice. I joked around that I was going to send an evil little elf as it was Christmas after my roommate's boyfriend for being so demanding and rude, and he laughed it off. That same night, my roommate told me next morning that my roommate's boyfriend woke up in the middle of the night with an ugly little man's face staring at him by the glow of the light of his Christmas trees in the barracks room. He woke up my roommate and was terrified. I'm still not sure why he would have seen anything, but he was very scared to pick on me again. The same roommate from the previous story was quite an abrasive person and typically rubbed the wrong way with people. We had gone through boot camp together, so I was used to her personality. She'd been having some trouble getting along with other people at our command ward and was venting to me in our common room. She was slightly religious and asked to read me a Bible passage to explain how it was helping her through her rough time. I, despite my family, am not at all religious, but I'm always open to hear people out. I sat and listened as she began reading from her Bible and within a few words, I started coughing and choking, similar to when you start coughing on your own saliva. Out of nowhere, she stopped and asked if I was okay. And I stopped choking and assured her that I was fine. Perhaps that was just strange timing. Also, when I watch movies, including possessions or exorcism scenes, I tend to feel ill, hot and get a headache. But once the film is over, it subsides and I'm fine again. It was such an issue that my now ex-husband used to try and stop me from watching these movies to avoid feeling ill. But I love Halloween and horror movies, so I didn't care. No matter what it was, these movies had some weird effect on me. I just always had these strange things happen to me and no one could ever give me an explanation as to what they could have been. Even my parents have told me strange things before, like saying, they had to cleanse my room with sage because something was in there. Also, when they were giving me sage to cleanse a new house I had moved into with my family, 
They double backed the sage and told me not to touch it with my bare hands, because I would ruin the sage. Mind you, they didn't mean that no one could touch the sage, just me. So that's my collection of spooky stories. I'm interested to hear any theories anyone might have as to what this could be. I was a sailor in the Navy who spent a lot of time out at sea, probably weeks and weeks at a time. One such of my jobs was being a lookout to spot boats, planes and things in the water or air pretty much and report it back to the ship. My lookout rotation could have me standing watch during the day or night, sometimes both. And it was during the night where I was pretty afraid, especially if you were at the back of the ship alone. For anyone who hasn't been out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night, you realize you see many more lights move in the sky than you ever would in a city. And on Navy ships, they like to have every little light on at night. So standing watch around 1am feels very alien sometimes. During the night, without a bright moon to help your vision, you may as well be on a different planet. There was this one time I saw a bright green color moving in the water slowly, and I didn't know what it was. My mind told me it must be a USO or something else. Eventually, I was told it was just plankton, but it sure looked freaky to someone who was unaware of this. Another time me and another guy were standing watch together. And I decided to just look up during 2am and see what I think is coming across the midnight sky. I would see meteors streak across the sky. But a few times there would be bright lights moving slowly way out there, maybe a satellite who knows. But I stared at it for a good 20 minutes. And approximately 15 of those slow moving lights moved in different ways. Either way, they were a few times I saw for myself just how vast space is and that there really is so much that we don't know and have yet to discover. Please understand that this is not who I am any longer. It's not the way I currently think or feel. What you're about to read is an unadulterated insight into how the USMC operates. It's how they make 18 to 19 year old kids do what most adults couldn't comprehend doing. That being said, it's important other people learn so that maybe the stigma of mental health issues surrounding our veterans ends, and hopefully sooner rather than later. I joined the USMC officially on June 11th of 2007. So I missed a lot of the really ugly stuff they saw during the initial war with Iraq slash Afghanistan. However, that being said, I still saw more than my fair share of things that left me completely and utterly spent. I justified all of my actions as a case of if I don't do this, then this will be done to me. Even though looking back on it, I'm not really sure I believe that any longer. I don't know that I ever did. But I told myself that to protect myself from taking responsibility from my actions. When we deployed to Iraq, I was stationed near a town called Ramadi. At the time, I called it a complete crap hole. Today, looking back, it's not much different to where I live now. People just going about their lives wanting to be left alone, wanting to have the same things we want, food, water, and a safe place to live. Those things we often take for granted. These people didn't. They didn't know when we were going to kick down their door on some tip from some scared family who we had threatened with imprisonment and torture not before long. So many times these tips went without a solid lead. I just remember one that sticks out as being actually accurate. We were told this guy was an explosives manufacturer and had a weapon stashed under his floor. We were told to expect resistance going in and we were told the same stuff we were always told when we hit a house. What we weren't told was to expect children, expect children with AK 47s and other assorted weapons 
waiting for us inside the house. When we went in screaming to get down, all these little kids, babies effectively, I have children now that were older than these kids. Initially, they did nothing. They looked at us, they weren't scared of us, but they were scared when we told one to drop his weapon. He raised it at us before he could pull the trigger. And you can imagine what we had to do. The rest dropped theirs and cried on the floor. We had just proven what every evil adult had told these kids to be true, that we were the bogeymen. To this day, I remember his eyes. I remember how he was so scared and confused. We cleared the house and got the dude making the explosives. But I never felt like it was a successful run. I felt awful. To this day, every time I close my eyes, I see his. I've prayed so many times for those eyes to stop haunting me. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. As always, I'd like to give a huge thank you to each and every one of my patrons for their continued help and support. If you'd like to join Patreon and help keep the channel running with regular donations every month, it would mean a lot. So feel free to check it out. And again, a huge thank you to each and every one of the service men and women who are in the armed forces. They have to go through so much. Just know that your sacrifice is appreciated. Thank you. Oh, spooky stories indeed. Uh, I had to be very careful with the wording. You guys know why, but I'm pretty sure you understood the stories. I tried to make sure that I word it properly and so that it's understandable. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I could be in the armed forces. I'm, uh, no, I just don't think I'm the right fit for it. So that's why when anyone tells me they're in it, mad respect. I was at a wedding about nine months ago and I met a guy who was, who was in the army. He was so nice. So yeah, but it just must be hard on his wife because she's home alone for months at a time and barely gets to see him. But still, people, they work it out. So good for them. Yeah, I hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. If you did, don't forget to do what you, you know, the comments and the liking and stuff. That really does mean a lot. And it's the first of a month, which means a brand new month. I really would like to kick this month off on Monday with a few cryptid stories, maybe some like wood stories and stuff. I just feel in the mood to do those kind of stories, but perhaps I'll put out some polls and see what you guys are feeling like. In any case, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.